Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. Stoveleg Media, igniting conversation. Hey guys, it's me, your host, Elena Grace, and you're listening to another episode of I've Been Thinking. So today, we're going to do things just a little different than like our normal monthly routine goes, okay? Because usually... The first of the month, like the first Friday of the month, is our book of the month day. Um, But, unfortunately, the book that I really wanted to share with you all hasn't come in the mail yet. um, Because I wanted to order the hard copy. And then I ordered another book that I also wanted, like the paperback of, like the physical copy, you know. And it was supposed to be here, and then I realized that I read the delivery time wrong, so that's my bad. But anyway, um, point is, we are doing something different today, and then you will still get a book of the month this month, um, but it's going to be like next week, probably. Anyway. So, today, I am bringing you a fun little list in honor of Women's History Month, okay? So, it is my five personal favorite historical heroines. Now, this was really hard for me, okay? So, I was raised on girl power. Literally, like, my dad was all about it. All about, like, boys suck, you're a girl, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, lit. So, narrowing down to a list of, like, five women has been really difficult for me. Um, And honestly, I kind of didn't even do it. And you'll see what I mean. But I wanted to include so many people, right? Like there were so many women throughout history that I just feel awful not having them on this list. Like the first woman to take a bullet in battle for the United States of America, for example, um, who dressed as a man um, in order to be able to go into battle. Incredible. Um, All the women, all of the women who have cross-dressed to serve their country, all of the women who have served their country in general, America or otherwise, all of the suffragettes throughout history, all of the women who have fought for racial equality, all of the women who have, I mean, just stood up for themselves, like Mary Maloney friggin' followed Winston Churchill around with a cowbell. I wanted to include her. That's so funny. That is such a funny way to to tell somebody you're displeased with what they're saying. A really annoying. The Irish lover. There's a, a statue of her um, in downtown Dublin. I mean, just like there are so many women that come to mind from 
confirmed history and also from legends that I'm just like, I want them to be on this list, right? But I narrowed it down. It was really, really hard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of tell you their story, okay? Um, which I'm really excited about because these are, I mean, they're incredibly interesting stories, okay? So let's, let's just jump in rather than me talking about all the people I wanted to talk about. We'll just get started. So first on my list is Boudicca, the baddest of all the bitches. So Boudicca, you, like you might not have ever heard of her in, in the United States. We don't really learn about her in the UK. I know that they do. Um, but Boudicca was the queen of the Celtic Iceni tribe, which was located in what is modern day Britain. Her husband, Prasutagus, was an ally of Rome. And upon his death, um, he, like, it was tradition that Boudicca would have remained queen. And she would have, like, still been in charge of the tribe, right? But his estate was to be split up between the Emperor Nero, the Emperor of Rome, and his two daughters, their two daughters. The Romans did not vibe with that, though. And all their lands were taken by Rome when Prasutagus died. So, uh, they also did not respect a female leader. And they said, screw y'all, you're not recognized as allies anymore either. So, Boudicca obviously objected to all of this. Um, Unfortunately, because she spoke out against the Romans... They beat her publicly, and they raped her two daughters. This did not fly with Boudicca, though. She was an independent lady. And this is, I want to take a second and just talk about how this is like a, an aside um, rant. Um, the Celts were called savages by the Romans, right? But the Celts had autonomy, like individual autonomy for men and women. Um, women could hold, like, power. Um, in fact, in a lot of Celtic tribes, the hereditary line, like, for power was through the maternal line. So women inherited power, not men, uh, which is shocking not shocking it, it's a shock because like we're raised to believe that the romans were like so advanced and blah 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 and the celts were savages which is kind of where i'm going the celts are called savages but they were f- far more advanced than the romans let on And just the fact that they were kind of Iron Age, semi-nomadic peoples who, uh, I don't know, weren't concerned about building massive cities um, or enslaving other countries, the Romans were like, "Mm, nah, barbarians, they're nothing to worry about. Meanwhile, the Celts were using soap a thousand years before the Romans had ever heard of what a bath was, but anyway... So, um, like I said, Boudicca was an independent bad bitch, and so she gathered multiple tribes together to revolt against their Roman oppressors, because, I mean, the Romans were literally colonizers trying to take, and eventually, you know, somewhat succeeding in taking over Great Britain, like that area, Um, and so, and they were very oppressive. So, her revolt left major Roman cities, including what is now London, like modern day London, England, in burnt ruins. And it cost over 80,000 lives. This was Boudicca's revenge for humiliating her, raping her daughters, and taking their lands that were 
theirs. So she, I'm, she raged across England and she was defeated only, only because the Romans retreated. So this, um, I don't remember how many it was, but some, a Roman general and his troops were sent out to meet her because, I mean, they were, they were destroying everything in her path. And so a Roman general and his troops were sent out to meet her to stop her. And they tried to and failed and tried to and failed and tried to and failed. And so they began retreating until they found a spot where they could use her own tactics against her. Um, which is frustrating when you're like pro Boudicca because you're like, oh, Boudicca, why'd you let them do that? But from a purely strategic perspective is like an awesome kind of way to go about that to realize what your enemy is doing and retreat until you find exactly the spot. I mean, pick your battles more like pick your battlefield. You know what I'm saying? But um, so that's what he did. And the Celts were unfortunately defeated. And I mean, they found the primo battlefield to use against her. And I won't go too deep into explaining that because I can. Trust me, I love this. But their the Iceni and their allies were um, unfortunately defeated by the Romans and. Boudicca herself, though, more than likely actually survived the battle. Um, there are various explanations that are guessed at as to what happened to her and her daughters. And the true fate is unknown, probably will never be figured out. But there, a prominent one is that she and her two daughters committed suicide by drinking poison rather than being taken captive. Either way, how whatever happened uh, to them, she makes my list because she did not I- let anyone, even a Roman emperor, tell her what to do. And when a man gave her a hard time, she gave him 15 shades of hell in response. I think that we should all honestly be inspired by her confidence in herself and her people, her ruthlessness in the face of misogyny and oppression, and her courage of conviction. So, number one, Boudicca. Number two, Mary Wollstonecraft, an original women's rights activist. Mary was a writer, a philosopher, and an advocate in 16th century England. Mary wrote a book in 1792 titled A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, wherein she argues that women only appear inferior to men because they are not given the opportunity for education in order And in order for a society to be founded on reason, men and women must be both treated as rational beings. Incredible. Groundbreaking. It's crazy that people today still don't freaking think that way. I, I can't. So, unfortunately, um, Mary Wollstonecraft died, um, a little, Over a week after giving birth to her daughter, Mary Godwin, who would grow up to become Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Now, upon her death, uh, Mary's widower, William Godwin, published a memoir of her life. And I think that he did this with the utmost love, but it was very truthful And this memoir absolutely destroyed her reputation because she had a very unorthodox lifestyle for the time. She had had multiple affairs. She believed in free love. She had a daughter out of wedlock. Um, Her marriage to William Godwin, I believe, started as an affair, if I'm not wrong. And Mary was educated, which was 
wild. I mean, that was the cherry on top of the cake. We can't let our women get educated. They'll start sleeping around. I mean, obviously, they correlate. Anyway, now, Mary Shelley, her daughter, was incredibly inspired by her mother's life. And the influence of her mother's legacy shaped Mary Shelley into the woman she would eventually become, including becoming the inventor of the sci-fi genre. And for that reason, for, for many reasons, Mary Wollstonecraft is on our list as number two because she is an original women's rights advocate because I think that we should all be inspired by her to live our lives the way that makes us happy um, and to always search for joy and to not care what other people think, but to care about how other people are treated. Next on the list is Irina Sindler. Now, Irina was born on February 15th, 1910 in Warsaw to a physician and his wife. Irina grew up to be a product of her raising. She, her, her family had an incredible history, okay? Her father passed away when she was about seven after he contracted typhus from treating patients that other doctors refused to treat because they were too scared of contracting the disease themselves. Many of these patients were Jews, which was kind of another stumbling block in them receiving treatment, right? So after her father's death, the Jewish community leaders actually offered to pay for Irina's education in thanks for her father's compassion and dedication to helping the ill in the Jewish community. She attended Warsaw or University of Warsaw, sorry, um, and she was always very opposed to the racist systems that were put in place at a lot of pre-war Polish universities, including the one that she attended, and she publicly protested against it. This actually led to her being suspended from the University of Warsaw for three years just because she spoke up. But like I said, she came from a rebellious family. Her great-grandfather had actually led a rebellion against the Tsars. So I think it was in her DNA to stand up for others. Now, when the Germans invaded Warsaw in 1939... Irina began offering Jews food and shelter. In 1940, the Warsaw Ghetto was erected, and she could no longer help the Jews the way that she had been. Over 450,000 Jewish people were forced into the ghetto. That, that's where the word ghetto comes from, by the way, was the sanctioned-off sections of the city um, with Poor infrastructure, poor, um, what's the word, utilities. Anyway, not very nice sanctioned off areas of the city where they would shove the Jews. And these have been around since the time of Shakespeare. This isn't a new idea, but of course the Nazis made it a commonplace, I suppose. Um, Anyway, so... 450,000 Jewish people were forced into the ghetto. So Irina tried to figure out how she could help, right? So she began saving orphaned children. She used her credentials as a Polish social worker and papers from a worker um, that was a member or from a worker at the contagious disease department And this person was also a member of an underground rebel group. So before she had ever joined this group, it's called Zagota. Before she had ever joined this group, Irina and a few helpers made over 3,000 falsified documents to help Jewish families, which is wild, absolutely insane. But what they would do, and eventually Irina did join Zagota, And she was put in charge of helping children. Um, Like, 
she was the person in the group in charge of helping Jewish children, right? Um, so she and the volunteers who would go with her would go into the ghetto, and they had a few different pre- preferred methods of smuggling kids out. So option one, they would use an ambulance. They would go in in an ambulance, and then they would come out, and they would have a kid hiding underneath the stretcher in the ambulance where nobody could see them. Um, Two, there was an old courthouse on the edge of the ghetto that was like not like nobody used it or paid attention to it or whatever, and somehow they could escape through there. Three, they would use underground tunnels and sewer pipes. Imagine. I mean, imagine. Four, they would put kids in like a suitcase or a sack and then put them on a trolley. And then nobody would like realize there was a child inside a freaking suitcase. And then five, they would legally remove a child on an ambulance if the kid was able to fake that they were super sick. Now, a few years back, Irina's story kind of went viral because she would sometimes use a dog that would actually whine and bark over top of baby's cries to distract the guards from the sound of like a baby crying, which she did actually do that sometimes. But out of the many, many rescues she did, like a minuscule amount of them used the doggo. But I still wanted to mention that because she was like, I mean, that strategy kind of went viral a few years ago. And you'll probably kind of vaguely remember that now that I've said it. Now, Irina kept record of all of the children that she saved and what families they were placed with to keep them safe during the war. And all of these families were aware that the children would hopefully go back to their parents um, or their families when the war was over. So, when the war was over, Irina dug up the bottles. She hid, she wrote the um, names and where they were placed and all of that on, like, tissue paper and put it in bottles and she buried them. So, she dug up the bottles of documents that she had buried so she could begin connecting children with their families. Almost all. All of the children's parents that she, almost all of the children that she had rescued, almost all of their parents had died at the Treblinka death camp, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Now, Irina was arrested during the war. She was caught and she fed the interrogator this fabricated story that she and Zagota had prepared for this very kind of situation, right? Irina was tortured. I mean, she had problems with her legs and feet for the rest of her life because of the torture she endured. But Zagota had actually bribed the executioner, and he helped her escape. But the announcement was made that she was executed, So that way there was no more like suspicion on her. No one was looking for her. So Irina had to stay in hiding until after the war. Now, all of this, like the whole reason we even know her name, because she was never the kind of person to say like, hey, look at me, look at what I did. The whole reason we know her name was because in the 1990s, a group of girls in Kansas were working on like a history project and they were inspired by a magazine clipping that mentioned her that mentioned Irina as another Schindler you know like Schindler's List so this group of girls in Kansas in the 90s dedicated all this time to learning about her and like, finding out all they could about her and sharing her story. And so what started as a school project became a way to raise awareness about the this incredible woman who risked literally everything for other people, for strangers. 
Now, I didn't mean for her story to be so long, um, but, you know, compared to the others, but damn, I couldn't not tell, like, tell you all of this. Her story is inspiring and it is heartbreaking. And I honestly encourage you to learn more. Um, I'm going to put on the blog post for today's post, there will be links to like my sources as always, but I'm going to put the link to the website about her um, in the show notes as well. So you can find it like easier. It is just her story is incredible. And I hope that her story inspires you to be like her, to rebel against oppression and fascism, and to risk everything for what's right. Her selflessness is why she's on this list. Now, next on the list, we have Ruby Bridges and her mother. Ruby was born in 1954 in Mississippi. Her family eventually moved to New Orleans, and at six years old, now I want to repeat this again, six, she was a tiny little baby, six, Ruby became the first black student to integrate an elementary school in the American South, in New Orleans, to be exact. To be six years old and be instrumental in the civil rights movement. Literally iconic. Now, Ruby was born in the year that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board that racial segregation in public schools was no bueno. So that's important that she was born in that same year of Brown v. Board. But southern states continued to resist, clearly, because by the time she was six, they still had not desegregated. So a federal court ordered Louisiana to desegregate at this point. And the school's response to that, to try to continue and perpetuate segregation, um, because they knew that black schools didn't have the same resources and the same quality of education all around, the white schools created entrance exams to test black students to see if they could academically compete at the all-white schools. So, Ruby and five other students passed. But Ruby ended up being the only little kid to go to the specific school that she went to. It was like a few blocks from her house. A few of um, the other students went to another school. One or two of them stayed at the black school. And then Ruby went to this one. Now, of course, they delayed her admittance and tried to do all this stuff. And uh, Her family was actually super unsure about her going. Well, some of her family was. Her dad was super worried about her safety. But her mother, a bad bitch, wanted Ruby to be given the education that she had been denied. That both of her parents had been denied. So she insisted that Ruby should be able to go to this school. Now, Four federal marshals escorted Ruby and her mother on their walk to school every day that year. They walked past crowds screaming slurs, and even one woman held up a black baby doll in a coffin. When asked later, Ruby said that that was the only time she ever got scared, was when she saw that black baby doll in a coffin. She said that nothing else had scared her, but that did. Her whole entire first day was spent in the principal's office because her attendance created chaos as angry parents withdrew their children from the school for the day and some permanently because, you know, let's punish the child who's trying to get an education and put her in the principal's office all day long. It's like girls being sent home for having their shoulders showing because boys can't focus. Anyway. The only teacher who was willing to teach Ruby was a white woman from Boston. So Ruby learned in a classroom alone. She ate lunch alone. And sometimes she played at recess with her teacher. 
not with the other kids. Ruby never missed a day, though. However, her family suffered. Um, Her dad lost his job because of because of this and her mom couldn't even buy groceries at some stores some stores would not sell her mother groceries because their child was going to a white school because of their bravery in the face of racism anyway uh, ruby's grandparents were evicted from the farm that they had lived on and sharecropped on for half a century um ruby earned her education though And she graduated from a desegregated high school. Over time, more black students actually enrolled in that school. And eventually, even her own nieces would attend the same school, which I think is so sweet. So, for obvious reasons, Ruby's story is iconic. And she and her mother are on this list for their bravery and their selflessness that changed the world for everyone. I could not include her the more I thought about this list. I mean, to be six years old and to become a face of American civil rights, to be six years old and to trek through hate and vitriol every day, even as you maintain perfect attendance and learn in isolation because no one else wanted their children to learn with you. To be six... And have the world put on your shoulders, whether she knew it or not. I think that it would have broken my spirit to have had all of that hate put on me and my family. Um, So, Ruby and her mother are on this list because of their courage, their strength, and their dedication. May we all learn from them and spend our energy bettering ourselves and the lives of others. And finally, the fifth listing, the fifth, um, what's the, the fifth, whatever, the f- number five, every single fucking one of the women throughout history who have taken up arms, taken up pen and paper, or taken a seat to defy the oppression that they suffered, the patriarchy, and or the evil that they were faced with, whatever it may have been. I want to deserve to call myself a woman alongside of them. And so I'm going to use what I've been given to fight for myself and for others. And I hope that these incredible women throughout history, their stories, I hope that this episode inspires you to fight with all your strength for what you believe in, for what's right, and for the betterment of yourself and others. Now, I hope you guys have so enjoyed this episode. It was so much fun for me to write. I loved researching all of it, Um, and I really hope that you enjoyed it. Make sure that if you did enjoy, you subscribe wherever you listen. Make sure you go subscribe as a Patreon so you can kind of help support the podcast um, and also so that you can get tons and tons of extra content every month and you get early episodes. Follow us on Instagram at I've Been Thinking Pod. Check out the blog post for today's post on I've been thinking pod.com where you can um, see all the resources that I used to research this and yeah go girls go girl power thanks so much for listening guys I hope you loved it happy women's history month I love you I'll talk at you next week bye Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. 
Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder, and I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. Check out great deals throughout the store at Safeway. This week at Safeway, get mega packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Chuck Roast for $3.97 per pound with digital coupon limit two packages. Plus, Hass Avocados are 10 for $10 member price. And get Fuji Apples for just $0.77 cents per pound with digital coupon. Also this week at Safeway, get selected varieties of Lucerne Milk Gallons for the member price of $3.99 each when you buy two. Visit Safeway.com or head into your local store for more deals. 